Thank you for that, Jim. Um, big fan of biblical literacy. Also a big fan of uh, Bible memorization, right? And we talk about biblical literacy and how it's kind of becoming lost in this generation. Um, I think it goes hand in hand with memorization and um, really uh, putting that into heart, the words of the Lord, and uh, hiding it in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Merry Christmas. One more week and it is Christmas Day, as you have heard. Um, this Sunday, today, this morning, we're going to be uh, studying a little bit about Advent. Um, if you're around church or Christian circles, you might have heard of, of Advent and uh, you know, that, that terminology. What is it? Um, is it some sort of fancy church word? Maybe. Uh, it's derived from Latin, so yeah, maybe it's, it's a little fancy. Uh, that means coming or arrival. The first advent is when Jesus came to earth in the form of a baby uh, about 2,000 plus years ago. And this was prophesied many times in the Old Testament, beginning in Genesis 3.15. Prophets of the Old Testament spoke and wrote about it as well, most notably Isaiah. And that's the first advent. The second advent is one that hasn't happened yet and is still to come. The one we are currently looking forward to when Christ comes back to take his bride, the church. And so for this morning, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and an usher will make sure to get you one. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Um, has anyone read through the book of Hebrews all the way through before? Yeah. Cool. Just asking. So a little bit of context before we get into the passage. The book of Hebrews was written to the Jewish Christians of the early church who were struggling to persevere in their faith in Jesus in the midst of heavy persecution. Some of them were going back to their old way of adhering to the Jewish laws, and because of this, the writer of Hebrews wanted to affirm and encourage his Jewish brothers and sisters that the way of Jesus is better and that they should not give up on the faith just yet. The beginning of Hebrews chapter 10, our text this morning, looks at the sacrifice of Jesus, that he is once and for all the only sacrifice that is needed for the forgiveness of sins. And it ends by mentioning the establishment of of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. Now, in light of this, we'll be studying the importance of waiting on the advent of Jesus, his coming, both the why and the how. Because why we wait matters and how we wait matters. And truly, it's an honor to open up the word with you all and, and just talk about Jesus this morning. And I love to just open up the Bible and let it speak for itself. And my hope and prayer is that we grow in our love for him, for his word, and that we are changed by it. So why don't we stand and read the word of the Lord together. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We give it to you, God. We pray that you would make it clear to us, Lord, what you want us to know about you today. 
Lord, we just ask that you would remove any hindrance or anything that is stopping us from hearing from you clearly, from seeing you fully. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is alive. And we thank you that it does not return void and it will continue to work in us even after we're done. Help us to look to you, Jesus. Help us to see you in the midst of all of this. We thank you for the Advent season and the Christmas season and what it truly means. Let it always be about you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So if you're taking notes, our, our first thought for this morning is why we wait matters why we make matters. And we're going to be looking at the first three verses of, of our text this morning, verses 19 through 21. Before the how comes the why, right? Uh, there are three observations we can pinpoint in the first three verses of our text that point us to Jesus, right? The ultimate why behind our waiting. So let's read verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Simply speaking, the blood of Jesus is what gives us confidence to enter the holy place. Let's, uh, let's look at the word right there, brothers. Other translations say brothers and sisters. Others say brethren. Um, I love the meaning behind this word, and it just means sibling believers, right? I, I love the family aspect uh, that is seen throughout the book of Hebrews. No doubt the Jewish Christians reading this text were well-versed on the Old Testament worship system, right? Um, if you're a Bible uh, reader, um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. And it's probably safe to assume that there were some still coming out of that old system. In the Old Testament, just as a little summary, the people could, not on, uh, the people could only worship God from a distance, right? They could not enter the Holy of Holies. Uh, only the high priest can do that. But in Christ... Because of his blood, they are brought near. Now, let's talk about blood for, for a little bit. I'm not trying to be gory or anything, uh, but blood holds a great significance in Jewish culture. Leviticus speaks of the life of the flesh being in the blood. Blood had been a part of multiple covenants between God and his people. I encourage you to listen to our Genesis series where we talk about a lot of those covenants. All of it is a foreshadowing of Jesus who fulfilled all of the covenants with his own blood. And because of this, we are compelled to draw near to Christ by his blood as well. At least I hope we are. To know that Jesus suffered and died for us, to know what he went through in order to buy us back, forsaken and betrayed by his friends, beaten and scorned, crucified and murdered, separated from the Father. Wait, I thought this was a Christmas message, right? This is a Christmas message, because this is what Christmas really is about. Does something inside of you get stirred up when you hear this, when you hear about what Jesus went through? I hope so, because this is our story, right? Um, it's not a pretty one, but it's our story nonetheless. It should be celebrated, it should be studied, and it should be a constant reminder to us of what we have in Christ and what it took to get there. And this is why we study the Bible the way we do, right? Verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And this is why we, we celebrate communion every month, remembering Jesus and his body being broken, his blood being spilled. And this is also why we, we sing the songs that we sing, Right? And I think this is why hymns are great. I, I'm a, okay, shameless plug from your worship leader. Hymns are awesome, right? Um, they're timeless, right? They've been around for hundreds of years for a reason. Um, really, it, we, can, we can sometimes, most of the time, find the whole gospel in one song. And um, I'm, I wasn't always a fan of hymns, but um, somehow the Lord made me rediscover it, and I love it. And I hope that you rediscover that too. Okay, plug over. Um, and we're not robots either, right? When we worship the Lord, uh, we can show emotion, right? We, uh, we know that God invented emotion, but 
We don't worship the emotion. It's simply a response to the true worship that's already happening in us. And so let's take a moment to reflect on the approachability of God right, when it comes to, to him and his presence. It wasn't always like this in the Old Testament. Um, it, again, if you're a Bible reader, uh, people literally died in the presence of his glory, of God's glory. But by the blood, we can enter it, and that alone in itself would be amazing, right? Just entering, oh, cool, I can, I can go in, sounds good. But our text not only says we can enter, but we can have confidence and boldness in our entering. That's a game changer, knowing that we are welcome to do so. I don't know about you guys, but there's, there's no feeling like being welcomed, right? Entering into someone's home and it's like, you know, nice and warm. There's like hot chocolate and like pie. I don't know. It's the holidays, right? And you feel the hospitality, uh, the hospitality and love just flowing. You know, when our presence isn't a burden to the guest, to the, to the host. When we know that our God wants us to be in his presence, there's no awkwardness, right? There's, you don't have to, like, you know, feel like you have to walk in eggshells. No fear, just acceptance. No need to approach God haphazardly either because he approached us first. So we can reflect on that. We can also reflect on what the Lord has brought us out from and where we are now because of his blood. Seeing his goodness, his patience, his fidelity, and steadfast love for us sinners, his hand guiding us through each and every step, even when we didn't know it, even when we didn't want it. And all we can say really is praise God. And hallelujah, Jesus. Let's read ahead. Verse 20. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Simply speaking, Jesus has given us a new way to live. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the new way to live. The word new here means new, but the word here living in the Greek means resurrected. It's not just someone who's already alive, it's someone who was dead, but is now alive. Meaning those who believe in Jesus receive newness of life in him, our resurrected and living Savior. John 14, 6 says this, I'm sure most of you know it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's Jesus speaking, by the way. And in the same way that the curtain was torn and destroyed right from top to bottom, Jesus' body was torn and destroyed in our behalf, providing access into God's presence. Because the price of sin had to be paid. The price of sin had to be paid, and the only reason we can draw near to God is because Jesus paid that price through his death. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, for Christ also suffered once for our sins, for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. It's kind of a paradox, right? Out of, out of Christ's death comes everlasting life and a new way of living for those who are in him. And how we live, how we respond to that is our act of worship. Let's read ahead. Verse 21. Since we have a great priest over the house of God. And in this verse, we see that Jesus has established himself as our high priest. Hebrews 4, 
verses 14 through 16 says this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. What is the response? Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I talked about Bible memorization a couple minutes ago. I urge you and I encourage you to memorize this passage. Memorize this passage. Write it down on a little post-it note and, and, and put it somewhere you can see it every day because these verses are powerful. And it's a wonderful reminder of who Jesus truly is and the, and the level of access we have in him. Our cause for approach is this. It's that Jesus is able to sympathize with us. What does that truly mean? That's a big word, right? Sympathize. What does that mean? Does this mean that Jesus just kind of feels sorry for us? No, I hope not, right? No. No, this sympathy isn't some blind pity thrown at us. It's not in Jesus' nature to be that detached. No, this is sympathy that goes deeper than that. In simpler terms, you can define Jesus' sympathy as this. It's solidarity with us. Solidarity. I love that word. I love what it means. That, that, that's true. He stands with us in solidarity. We would do well also to remember that Jesus is our advocate. Right? Our advocate. He secures our position in God's family. He stands with us. He's the one who knows what we are going through who is familiar with our pain and has shared in our struggles, who is at the right hand of the Father right now, praying on our behalf. He's all that and more. So why we wait matters. We eagerly and actively wait for Jesus because he has commanded us to do so in his word and has enabled us to do so by his blood. And we wait because we are sanctified and purified in our waiting. We are promised sympathy and, more than that, solidarity with our Savior. And if we yield to him and his purposes, we will become more and more like Jesus each day. Why we wait matters. And so we've considered the why. And now we look at the practical side of waiting in, in the how. How we wait matters. Let's look at verses 20, 22 through 25. How we wait. How do we wait? How do we, how do we do this? Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. To draw near. To draw near is a privilege. You can't just do that. It's a privilege. It's a gift from God. And it is what we get to do as the redeemed. And let that sink in for a moment. And I know we can kind of let these words kind of pass us by, but this, this is the King of Kings. Right? This is the Lord of Lords, creator of the universe, inviting us in. Why? I don't know. Because he can, and he wants to. Uh, you and I having a seat at God's table, that's crazy. Right? I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I'm worthy to be invited, let alone sit at the table. But he does so anyway. How much worth does this invitation hold? How much do we actually value it? The only true answer to that is found in our response to it. And the writer in this verse lays out what we should consider when we draw near to the presence of God. What does he say? He says, with a true heart. And this speaks of sincerity. 
It speaks of authenticity. Okay? God doesn't want fake. He doesn't deal in the fake. As a matter of fact, God sees right through the fake. He wants the real us. Think of the, the time and, and, and the energy we can save if we just approach God with sincerity and authenticity. Right? Consider the possibilities of a relationship with God based on honesty, where there's growth, where there's maturity, where there's good fruit, versus an act based on lies. Well, we can't impress God, right? We can't bring anything to the table. And God help us if we even try to hide anything from him. We can't. Adam and Eve tried. They failed. What makes us think we can succeed? The Psalms say he knows our frame. He knows how we are formed. So enough with the hypocrisy and the facade. There's already enough of that in the world. Why add to it? If we truly and wholeheartedly want to draw near to the presence of God, it requires us to strip away any kind of pretense we might have and be as open and honest as we can be to him. It's what he wants. It's what he's looking for. Right? Pastor Aaron mentioned earlier about God looking for true worshipers. Is that you this morning? So we draw near to God with the, with the true heart. What's next? We, we draw near to God, to the presence of God in full assurance of faith. Um, this is the confidence that we have in our faith. And we've kind of touched on this already. And this speaks of the guarantee we have that we can enter into God's presence and that he graciously accepts us when we do. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you, God. Next, uh, with our hearts sprinkled clean, which speaks of the washing of the blood of Jesus. Now, no doubt this would have resonated with the Jewish Christians who were reading this letter, since the word sprinkle here would remind them of what their ancestor did ancestors did in Egypt uh, when they sprinkled the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, saving them from the angel of death during the first Passover, right? It separated them from the rest of Egypt. Um, the angel of death knew that they were the chosen people of God, and so they were unaffected by it. The blood, again, the blood, the blood of Jesus speaks. It speaks of forgiveness from sin, freedom from guilt and shame, everlasting life, relationship, deep intimacy with our Father, the things we long for, right? The things in our hearts that we try to fill with a bunch of other random stuff. Jesus' blood, it's the only thing that can wash away our evil conscience. Are we listening? Are we responding to it accordingly? Next, it says bodies washed with pure water. And this is a daily cleansing that it's talking about. We need to be daily cleansed from this world because this world is dirty. Right? This is the cleansing we receive once and for all. Right? We receive a cleansing once and for all for, for all of our sin and death through Jesus. But since we still live in bodies that crave the flesh, we have to be washed daily. And how do we do that? By the word. Through the Spirit. Let's read on another passage. Verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast. This word here, hold fast, means to cling to tightly, right? To grab a hold of and not let go. But this phrase goes a little bit deeper than that. Uh, it actually speaks of a total commitment that is uncompromising. That is what to hold fast means. Hold fast to what? The confession of our hope. The confession that Christ is our only hope. In what way? Without wavering. Firm. Solid. Simply speaking, in our waiting, we are to be fully committed to the hope we have in Jesus and profess confidently that God's promises are reliable. 
You might ask, why does the author include this in the letter? Uh, most likely because some have wavered and some have compromised in their faith and confession. As we talked about earlier, based on the context that we know about the book of Hebrews, that some of the Jewish Christians have been turning away from Christianity and they're going back to their old ways. Really, we can see and read this verse as both instruction and warning against all of that. But really, don't we all have the tendency to, to doubt the promises of God from time to time? And to kind of qu question his, his judgment and ask, what's up with that? Why? If that's not you, and you've never experienced that, please talk to me after the service so you can give me all your secret success. Right? Because I'd love to hear it. It's part of our fallen nature to look at and focus on the visible things of the present and give up the unseen blessings of the future. This is our downfall. Right? It weakens our faith, and slowly but surely we are drifting farther and farther away from the presence of God. We are trusting him less. We are listening to him less. We're listening to other things more. Right? We're letting in more things that don't really matter and really should have no voice in our lives. And this is why the call to hold fast is so incredibly important. But by God's grace, the verse doesn't end there. There is that always timely reminder that he who promised is faithful. Can we repeat that this morning? He who promised is faithful. Man. Ugh. I love the word. It cuts us open and shows us the intent of our hearts. He's, he who promises is faithful. Again, another, another, another verse that you should memorize. 2 Timothy 2.13 says this. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Amen. It is, it is God's very nature to be faithful. It is who he is. And I, I've been alive for 30 years. Some of you might say, that's really young. And others say, that's really old. That's fine. <laughs> I've been walking with the Lord about half that time. Uh, and I can say without a shadow of a doubt right here, right now in front of you, that not once has he disappointed. And not once has he failed. And not once has he made a promise and not fulfill it. It's me. I'm the one who's failed. I'm the one who's fallen short. I'm the one who's walked away. It's never him. And so we have no right to point an angry finger at God and say, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. Because he's given us everything and so much more. So we can thank him for his faithfulness. We live lives accordingly. Let's read ahead. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us consider. What does that mean? Let us consider. In the Greek, it means this. The writer is saying, be concerned about this. This should be your, your greatest concern. Be concerned about how to stir up one another. To stir up speaks of encouragement. Stir up to what? To love sacrificially and participate in good works. Now you can agree with me here that there are a lot of issues that plague the church, right? The big C in 2022, even going into 2023. I mean, nothing's really changed that much. Lots of questions about what we should do about, you know, this or that and the other. Some of it important and some others not so much. But here we see the scriptures are crystal clear, right? No need to rack our brains. No need to, to, to approach so-called experts. If you have a question about what the church should be concerned about, this is it. To stir up one another in love and good works. 
I think sometimes we're, we're, we're guilty of misplaced concern. Our focus is on the wrong thing, right? Or the latest hot topic or the latest issue or what's on the news or what's on Twitter and social media. And we kind of talked about that for the past three weeks, right? And we end up harming the church more than helping it. I was soberly reminded this week of how beautiful the church is, how beautiful the bride of Christ is, and we don't even know it. And I pray we do. I pray we know how unique the church truly is, that it's a family, that in it we can find fellowship and friendship, that it's a place for the sick and for the broken, that it's a place where we can Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. To choose not to turn our backs against each other, but to bear each other's burdens instead. To stop gossiping with each other and against each other and praying for each other instead. Or I can have nothing in common at all with this person next to me, but it doesn't matter because we are bonded for all eternity through Jesus. Where else can you find that? My prayer is that we see the beauty and the uniqueness of the church and do everything we can to love and protect it. And that starts with us. We just heard it a couple minutes ago. Right? This church is what we make it to be. It truly comes down to the basics. We don't have to overcomplicate things. There's no seven steps. There's no ten tips on how comes down to the basics of what the Bible already speaks of, serving one another, praying for one another, gathering together like we're doing right now. The writer of Hebrews instructs us to do this all the more as as we wait for the day of Christ's return. This should be a sobering reminder to us that this, this writer of Hebrews is telling us to do this more because more and more people are going to be less likely to do it as the day of the Lord comes. And so even now, we press on. Even now, we should press forward even more. Why we wait matters and how we wait matters. We are not called to passively wait, but to actively participate in the work of Christ in the here and now. Always vigilant, always ready with oil in our lamps. The church still exists, right? Big C, the church. Then he's not done yet. He's not done. He's still saving people and adding to his family. He's still mending the broken, still walking with us in the midst of our pain. He's still welcoming sinners with open arms, faithfully reminding us to run back to him when we wander off. And we do a lot. found it interesting that in the New Testament's 260 chapters, it's a lot, Christ's return is mentioned over 300 times. 300 times. Write that down. The hope of his return should fill our minds daily and make our hearts ache and long for heaven. I love how we started our worship service by saying, I am going to heaven. Because that is true. That is reality. We can look forward to that. That is our hope because of Christ. And so we wait. And we wait patiently. But it's not just us that are waiting. Jesus waits for us too. And that's amazing. Right now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for us and giving us an open invitation to full communion with God. Right? Will we take it, or will we reject it? Really, there's, a really, there's really only two options. Right? We're always given choices, and this is a choice we have to make. And this is our opportunity to respond. And I'll close with this, and we're done. My hope, and... My prayer, personal prayer, is that we become a people who long to see Jesus above everything else. Long to see Jesus above everything else. 
and that we would draw strength and encouragement from knowing that he longs to be with us as well. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the, the truth that speaks to us so clearly. Why we wait matters, how we wait matters, and we wait for you, Lord. We're waiting on you right now. Thank you, Lord, that you are not finished with us yet, that you are still continuing this work in this world through your church. Lord, I pray that we as, as your people would seek out and, and, and know and, and, and get our marching orders from you when it comes to this, God. What it means to be active participants in your kingdom. Lord, forgive us for, for making, making it something else that it shouldn't be. For being passive, for being for being quiet when we should be speaking up. Thank you, Lord, that you give us opportunity, and thank you that this is all possible because of your son, Jesus. Lord, he is the reason why we are here. He is the reason why we celebrate Advent. He is the reason why we celebrate Christmas. Lord, I pray that that would not be lost on us in the busyness of this season and that we would make you our priority. Make you king over our hearts. Make you lord and ruler over everything in our lives. Tear down our idols, Lord God. Tear down our, our idols of self as we make room for you, as you take your rightful place in our hearts. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your for your mercies, which are new each and every day. And thank you, Lord, that every step of the way here on earth that you are with us, never leaving, never forsaken, as we wait on you. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you, my friend. Oh, I got some time, people. I like this. I haven't taught for like three or four weeks. I'm jonesing like crazy. I haven't even talked to these guys about Christmas Eve and Christmas Day yet. I'm probably taking them both and pretty excited about it. As we bring the service to the close, let's just uh, wait on the Lord for a minute, huh? The word Advent, you know, we're not too formal here. We don't like to uh, make too much of, again, uh, ourselves by quoting this and quoting that and, and pretending to understand Greek and Latin by quoting words that really we don't know how to pronounce in the first place just to sound important. Uh, we try to keep things very simple as this message did just represent. The word Advent is from the Latin and does have a meaning and it simply means arrival is one of the, the definitions of that word. And the concept adopted by the church is so very beautiful as this message demonstrated. It, it really has meant three things. Number one, celebrating the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. As we discussed today, long prophesied before it ever happened. From the moment of mankind's fall, Adam and Eve, there was the promise of deliverance through an impossible statement. The seed of the woman, right? There's the hope inserted into this situation. And so part of that Christmas season, that's how we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ, the promise of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is a word, and it's a big word, but it simply means how God became and came in flesh. And as the scriptures taught us today and teach us in other places still, we, be, we beheld his glory. Read the first chapter of John's gospel this week and just sit in awe and just... Just wonder at that. How did God do what he did? It's still a mystery we can't explain, and yet it's so glorious because God became like me in order to represent me. And all the, 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 the blood, right? Christianity is such a bloody religion. Why do we talk about the blood all the time? No, you don't understand. 
That's the price that was paid because my sin is so great. And anytime we look or listen or think or, or, or start singing the song of the world, which says, well, that's weird. No, go back to that that blood has been shed and had to be shed for your sin. Your sin was that gross. Your sin was that dark. Your sin was so serious. It took the blood of the king and kings and Lord of lords, his death to pay the price for your sin because the wages of sin is death. Amen? Man, celebrating that, that somehow, some way, the promise was fulfilled that God became a man, fully God and fully man, only that would work to pay the price for my sin. It was death, and he died so I wouldn't have to. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time, right? The incarnation, it's a simple word, but it means a lot, right? Uh, another part of that Advent celebration, again, that we talked about this morning is not only the coming of Christ, but the absolute necessity that I have to receive him. That's confusing sometimes because pastors make it confusing. <laughs> Oftentimes we're, we're trying to sell something other than declaring the truth of God as simply spoken um, in the scriptures. I must receive that King of Kings, that Lord of Lords. Yes, Jesus is the gift that God has given mankind, but that is a gift that must be received personally, right? As we said, as part of our worship, if you confess with your mouth and, and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. There's a receptivity. Okay, I believe what the scriptures have, have spoken concerning Jesus, and I receive the gift of himself that he offers to me. That sparks a eternal change in you and really solves so many problems, doesn't it? The Bible says that at that moment when you receive that gift, you will become born again. You will become something that you were not before. You'll have the same old name, right? The same soul, as it were, the same identity, but a whole new level of life has come your way, and that is the presence of the living God, the Holy Spirit. You will be his temple as you've given yourself to him, receiving the gift that he's offered you. That's part of Advent. That is so very important. So yes, it's celebrating Jesus that he's come into the world, but have you received him? Have you received him? May that be how we celebrate him this year. Have you received him? And not just initially for salvation, but again, we, we use the expression, Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's the, well, really the comparative uh, example that I can apply to my life. Am I living like he's Lord? That's part of celebrating Advent as we talked about today. He's come into the world, but he's come into my life and he's the Lord of my life. What he, what he says I do. Amen. And then part of that too, I love that he talked about it. Part of Advent traditionally, classically has been that he's coming again, folks. You ever, you know, we didn't plan worship this morning, by the way. I didn't really know what James is going to talk about either. So sit and soak in that for a minute. We sing like two heaven songs. I mean, that's, that's weird. We haven't sung the one in like 10 years at the end. And, and, you know, no coincidence, the first one either. Lord's talking to us today. And, and part of that is Christians aren't talking enough about heaven in these last days. It's been declining over the decades to the point where it's not even brought up anymore. We think somehow the kingdom of God is going to come back down to here and remain forever. And that's heresy. That's blasphemy. There are some things we can talk about, and we'll get to that in Revelation. Come see me after the service. But we're talking a new heaven and a new earth. That's where we'll spend forever with the Lord, right? That's, that's what his Bible says. The fact is, is, he is coming back for me and for you to take us to that place that he's prepared for us because we're his bride. That is part of Advent. That is something to be talked about and celebrated and, as James said, to be prepared for. Right? And that reflects directly upon how we're living. Preparing for his coming by holy living. That's it. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to him now for this Christmas season. All that it is, all that it means, all that we get to partake of, participate in. Apply these things personally to us, we pray now, Holy Spirit, and speak to us. Have we truly recognized who's come? 
to planet earth as a man to pay the price of my sin, our sin. But because he's God, death could not hold him down. Because he rose to newness of life, we will too. Have we considered, Lord, who you are and what you've done? With that, how could we not? If we've considered it, if we've, if we've seen it, Lord. If we've believed it, how could we not receive? Every man will be held accountable for what they do with Jesus Christ. You demand an answer. The psalmist said, kiss the son lest he be angry. Lord, that's the reception we must make concerning Jesus. Lord, have we done that? Have we embraced you? Do we just acknowledge you? Or have we embraced you? Have we bowed our knees to you? Have we said, you are the Lord? What do I do with your life, the life you've given me? Talk to us about that, Lord. How are we living? Are we the God of our own lives, or are you the Lord of my life? Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the power of the Spirit that, that, that makes that possible. But, Lord, is that where my will is at this morning? Humble us, Lord. Sober us, God. You are not one to be trifled with. How are we living, Lord? Are we looking up? Are we living in such a way as that reflects our faith? It's not about building my kingdom here. Yours either. Your kingdom is not of this world, you said. Am I preparing for your coming by loving as you've called me to? You said the world will know that we're your disciples by our love for one another. God is love, and he who loves is of God. Whoever doesn't love is not of God. You've summed up, Lord, what our life's to look like in such a simple way, love. Am I preparing for your coming, Lord? Is that the oil that's in my lamp? It's ever burning, ever being refilled by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit being love. Is that the light that my lamp is giving off? Is that the beautiful odor that the oil of love is disseminating, Lord, from my life? Doing the one thing you've called me to do. Talk to us about that, God. We thank you for the power of your spirit, Lord. We thank you for the authority of your word. I thank you, Lord, for the precious family, those who are here and those who are not, Lord, many hurting and many sick, many suffering right now, God, in our fellowship, precious sheep, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of serving them and pastoring them, Lord, in sickness and in health for better or worse and all the rest. We thank you for nearly 20 years, Lord, where we've seen your faithfulness, your mercy, your grace that just covers, Lord. We've seen good fruit, God. Continue to unite us together, we pray, as we look toward this new year. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your word, God a dependency on your Holy Spirit, a daily life that reflects the things that we celebrate during this Christmas season, Advent, Lord. We thank you that we're in a season where it's really just unparalleled, God, the opportunity that we have to those at work and those in the neighborhood and those family members that we rarely see. Lord, help our light to so shine. 
Help that oil of love to be ever burning, Lord, in our, in our lamps. Empower us, we pray. Send us out, Lord, with a joy, God, and a joy that, Lord, so clearly doesn't come from the world. It's not based on circumstances. Even when suffering, we have great joy because we have you. Let your joy be our light this week, Lord. Attracting the world to see why in the world we could be so filled with joy. Fill us with your peace, God. Give us good rest, Lord, as we take all these things seriously and lay them before you. Bless your people. Bless our fellowship now as we break and in, uh, enjoy some, Lord, some treats and just spend the afternoon investing in each other. We thank you, Lord. We love you. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us such a sharp discernment to see things clearly, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, and we say, Amen. Why don't you stand? God bless you.